All right, well, hello, and welcome to the first presentation of four aimed at energizing us and helping us to get the most out of Pope Francis's most recent writing, Emeris Laetitia, on joy in the family. Now, um, there are going to be four of these presentations. This is the first of four. They're going to cover the four key activities in pastoral ministry that Pope Francis is telling us to really focus on. This first week, we're going to look at listening. After that, we're going to look at accompanying, then discerning, and then evangelizing, all in the context of our work with families. Now, my job is to help us understand what Pope Francis is talking about when he wants us to be great listeners. He wants to revive a listening church where we are dialoguing and listening to each other about all the important stuff that we have to work on uh, as a family, as a, the family of God. So let me tell you where I'm going to go today. Um, the first thing we're going to address is why listening is so crucial and how it's so easy that our ministry loses listening as a value. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to point out some insights from social psychology uh, in ways that this happens to every uh, organization, including uh, the, the family of God. Now, second, I want to give you three keys to doing effective listening. And the first key is going to be to rediscover the miracle of eye contact and really savoring each other's faces. Uh, we live in a world that's losing the value of face-to-face -face contact and what can happen when we really learn how to savor each other's faces. I'm going to give you a few uh, tips that I've learned uh, in my work as a therapist. Second, I'm going to um, help us understand one of the key blocks to listening and how we overcome that block. I'm going to talk some today about how we kind of cross the bridge to other people or what uh, Father John Dunn the late, great Father John Dunn from uh, the University of Notre Dame talked about as the process of passing over, which allows us to encounter people in such a pure and meaningful way. And then third, um, we are going to look at how we explore and mirror when we're talking with people. Those are the two key skills that help people to feel listened to, how we explore through good questions, and then mirror back uh, what they uh, say to us. So that's where I'm going today. Really excited to do this. Before I jump in, I just want to shout out to the people who are making this very webinar possible. Uh, start with, of course, the Strong Catholic Families National Partnership, which is spearheading this whole deal, all these webinars. And then for today's webinar, we also have to shout out to RCL Benziger, who's helping to sponsor uh, me giving this to you and the recording and all that. So uh, grateful to be doing this with you. So let's jump in. Okay, so let's jump in with the importance of listening for our ministry. You know, Pope Francis has continued to remind us how important listening is to our ministry, and in particular, how important it is to be listening to the struggles and spiritual questions of the people that we serve and care for. And he is telling us now to pay more attention to that than to the spiritual principles and laws that we've developed and have tended to focus on teaching. He wants us to go from that back into listening to the raw experiences of people, that that's where we're going to experience God. Now the question is, why is that so important, number one? And number two, how is it that we so quickly forget about that and get lost talking about principles and teaching laws and formulas? Um, social psychologists can really help us here. Social psychologists have shown us that um, there, is an, there is an inevitable process that happens with every religious community. And I want to diagram this for you. It kind of starts out like this. So in this first season, people had this life-altering experience of God. It happens raw in their real life. After that experience is over, these people who have had this experience with God tend to come together and they tell each other their stories of how they experience God in this really wonderful and cool way. After telling their stories for a while, it leads to this third season. And in this third season, people need to figure out what happened and what didn't happen. So they formalize their stories and they write them down, which gives way to this fourth season where people use this, these stories to create laws and applications to apply to certain situations. So this is how the process would go for any organization and especially a religious community that gets started. But there's some unique things that happen that follow this pattern with our own uh, Christian community through the years. 
that the community started when people had this experience of Jesus. And they had these experiences where ears were opened and eyes were opened and they could see and they could hear. And then Jesus sent them out two by two. And as he sent them out and anointed them, he gave them this incredible power. They were strong. Satan fell from heaven. The kingdom of God had come. And then Jesus died and he rose and then he ascended, but he was gone. So people gathered to break bread and tell their story. And people got together and they remembered the stories of the kingdom of God and people being healed and the dead being raised. And as they broke bread, they experienced Jesus in a real way. That was a wonderful season. This led into this third season where people had to make sense of the stories and decide which of the stories were real and which of them were not. Because many of the stories were clearly real that others had experienced. But others, even though people were telling them, they realized, you know what? That never happened. And so they had to go with the stories that really did happen. Now that they had what we would call the canon of scripture, it led to this fourth season where they took all these stories and learned how they would apply to certain situations. And these were laws and these were principles taken together. It's the tradition. Now the thing to keep in mind is that this process is absolutely normal for communities and spiritual communities in particular. The problem happens when we do our ministry up here at this fourth season and this third season. Let me just give you a quick example of what I mean by that from my own work and my own ministry. So I'm a marriage therapist and I work with a lot of Christians. So a very common thing to happen in my office is someone comes in, married, usually around 17 years. Don't ask me why, but that's the magic number. People come in ready to divorce. They don't like each other. Sometimes there's an affair, an addiction, or some reason they're giving, but they just don't want to be married. Now I have to have a skillful way of engaging a couple like that. Now what's super tempting for me, and what I have done in the past, I'll admit, is to engage up here at the level of law and principle. And I tell people things like, it's a really bad idea for people to divorce. It's really bad for you if you look at the future based on research. It's really bad for your kids. It's really bad for like, like your dog and, and like your bank account. Um, and if you hang in there, statistically odds are good that you're going to be happier in five years if you stay married versus if you divorce. Now that's tempting to do that at the level. Or I could even give them the Catholic version of that, which as I'm sure you know in uh, part three, section two, chapter two of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, we would call divorce a grave offense against natural law. Now that one almost always brings people right back to falling in love, like immediately. Just kidding. Um, so that's if you come at us at level four. At level three, you might decide to quote the scriptures. You might quote like Matthew 19 saying, Jesus said you shouldn't divorce because divorce is something that God has made. But as you can imagine, and as I have found, this really doesn't work. It really doesn't help. What does help then is, um, in fact, uh, Pope Francis says, before I go on, he says that um, the problem with that, when we engage people at this level and, and throw the law at them, he said, it is like using the law as a stone that we throw into people's lives. It doesn't help. It doesn't work. And so what we need to do is find a way to engage down here. What we need to do is to find a way to engage, inviting people to tell their story, uh, inviting people to talk about what's happened over time. Even better than that, when we're with them, paying great attention to them, listening to their experience, to ask them what it's like for them right now. Like, talk to them now about what is prayer like? How hard is it to be in a house with someone that you don't really like anymore? Like, what's that been like? And to invite people to start talking about their present moment experience right now. That's where change uh, takes place. But how do we do that? And that's where we're going to go now. Um, Pope Francis gives us a whole lot of, of vision and insight about what it looks like to be a listening church for each other. And so uh, from this point, we're going to move forward. I'm going to talk about three keys to be a great listener, both in your ministry and also to create a culture of listening uh, wherever you're working. The first of those three keys uh, begins when we notice each other's faces. And now I know this sounds simple, but it is incredible to me that God has put six billion people on this planet and all of us have very unique faces. And the first step, I think, in listening is paying attention to the uniqueness of those faces. Uh, Pope Francis reminds us that reawakening to the uniqueness of each other's faces is actually going to be a link to reawaken to the sacred otherness that each of us ought to have for each other. He puts it like this. He says, the aesthetic experience of love is expressed in that gaze, which contemplates the other persons as ends in themselves, even if they are infirm, elderly, or physically unattractive. 
So Pope Francis is saying that it all starts with slowing down and paying attention, paying attention to the sacred otherness of one another. And I wonder, I was wondering to myself how, what that looks like, and I was reminded of the way people greet one another in South Africa. don't know if you're aware of this, but in South Africa, they greet one another by saying, Sobona. And Sobona means, I see you. And as I was doing a little research about that, it says that people in South Africa mean by that, I see your humanity, I see your vulnerability, I see who you are as a person. It kind of captures this sense of otherness. I had a great uh, supervisor I used to work with, and she used to say to me when we'd sit down to do our session, she would start our session by saying, it is just so good to look at you. And what she meant by that was we would do a lot of work by phone, but then we'd sit down in her office and do supervision. That was always such a grounding experience, and I think it prepared her to listen well to me. And, you know, this really noticing each other's faces is something we don't do well in this culture. And the impact is pretty severe, I think, in the way it hits our families and relationships. One of my uh, favorite uh, experiences that I ask couples to have with me is uh, very often when they'll be lost in their heads and with what's wrong and all the rules that have been broken in their marriage, I'll ask them to stop talking and I'll ask them to scooch close to each other and sometimes close their eyes for a moment or two and take a deep breath and remember who they are and remember who their partner is. And then I'll ask them in silence, about 18 inches apart, to just open their eyes and stay with each other's eyes, sometimes for two, three, four minutes. And it starts oftentimes very uncomfortably for people. But the amazing thing happens uh, that happens over time for partners is as they take in each other's eyes, something triggers in them. And it is not at all unusual for partners to begin to weep and husband and wife to begin to cry. And they don't know why they're crying. They just are beginning to feel again the sacred connection that they once had. All that happens not through words, not through ideas, not through theories. It happens because of the mystery of the sacred gaze of finding each other's eyes. And so I think this is really the first step of listening. And this is what Pope Francis is inviting us to do, is get good again at bringing that gaze to one another. I often think of this as part of our incarnational ministry, what we do when we are loving people on behalf of Jesus, which is we are showing up and bringing that gaze of love that first drew us to God in the first place. Only now we're bringing it to, to one another so that when they see us and they see us studying them and wanting to understand them and caring about the expression on their face, uh, they are experiencing really God's love in a way that is quite powerful. I think that's the first step and it's probably sometimes the most difficult, but it's a very powerful step. Uh, when I was a student at Notre Dame, one of my favorite professors was uh, Father John Dunn. Uh, he was a Holy Cross priest who they say has taught more Notre Dame students than any other professor, in part just because he lived so long. And everyone loved him. But one of the keys that um, Father John talked about was how important it was, especially with people from different religious groups or people who have different beliefs, to be able to leave all of our judgments and thoughts behind and really cross over and engage other people so that we can experience them uh, in a real way. And this is a theme we find throughout Pope Francis's writings. If you remember Enjoy the Gospel, Pope Francis reminded us how important it is to take off our shoes when we enter the sacred ground of the other. And this is, I think, what we need to do if we are going to listen really well and really hear what people uh, have to say. I know I learned this uh, when I was a young psychologist at the Children's Hospital, and uh, I used to work with children with diabetes. And one young man, his name was Kendrick, came in, a little 12-year-old, great little kid. Uh, he was dying from diabetes, which is unusual, but he was in such poor control because his family was doing so little to help him. Now, this doesn't make sense to people who take care of diabetes for a living. And so the staff had become very angry with the family and about why his diabetes was so bad. And so we would talk with them and they tried figuring out what was wrong, but they could not figure out what was wrong. So he would go in and out of the hospital. One day in my frustration, I had been called to consult on this case, and I met him several times. Finally, on my lunch hour, I just left my office, uh, got in my car, drove to his elementary school, which 
of course, broke all HIPAA regulations, but the good news was there weren't HIPAA regulations back when I did this. So um, I went and sat down in the classroom uh, with this teacher and I said, would you help me to understand Kendrick? Because we love this guy, but he's not going to be alive in high school if we don't do something different. Well, I came to find out that Kendrick's family was in a lot of trauma. The mom did not know how to read or write. Uh, they had all kinds of trauma. The mom had been assaulted recently. Uh, they had had to move several times because they didn't have money. And then the kicker was, I had learned that Kendrick, just a couple months before, had gone up to the local store with his friend on his bike. And as they were about to go in, a car drove by spraying the, sh the store with bullets and hit his friend and killed his friend. And his best friend had died in Kendrick's arms. Now, when they come to the hospital, they didn't tell us any of that. Somehow they didn't know that that was important for his diabetic care. But when I kind of passed over the comfort of our hospital and went into the hood and talked with that teacher, I learned all kinds of things on that ground that then allowed us to give Kendrick the help that he needed. He needed someone in the home. They needed someone to teach them how to do diabetic care without using a lot of words because the family didn't read. So it was one of these great experiences. And, and that one's sort of obvious, but you know, the people in our life, especially people who come from a different background, whether it's a different religion or even from a different like school of thought within the Catholic Church, when we start talking about things like divorce and homosexuality, very often, if we're going to have a meaningful conversation with someone, we need to master this art of kind of leaving our world behind crossing over this bridge and engaging people in their own unique world. Because here's the reality. You know, everyone has come to their conclusions in life based on a whole series of experiences, of abandonments, of betrayals, of pain, of blessing, of ecstasy. I mean, life is so complicated and we all get to these places where we think things and believe things uh, in different ways. And I often say, I've never met two couples who are divorcing who are divorcing for the exact same reasons. Every couple is unique. Every person who has a, diff a different sexual orientation is unique. Everyone is so unique, it requires this ability to pass over into their world. Um, by the way, as I've made references here to different uh, quotes from Amoris Letizia, as I've quoted Father John Dunn, if you are interested in these resources or a little bit more, you can come to my website, which is drtimhogan.com slash MOOC, M-O-O-C. And there I will have listings of all these references so you don't need to take super good notes or whatever. So finally, there's this third move that we need to make if we want to be really effective listeners, embodying God's presence as people who are genuinely interested and in wanting to hear what people have to say. And that third move, as I call it, is to explore well and then mirror. What do I mean by that? You know, there's nothing quite like being with someone who is genuinely interested in what you're going through, who's genuinely wanting to explore with you what it is that you're um, going through. Now, remember before, a temptation we have and a problem we can have is if we start engaging people up at that level three and four, where we're asking people what they believe or what they think, things that are likely to engage their ego and get them way off track. What I'm talking about here is helping people to explore their lived experience that's where they meet God. This is what Pope Francis is so big on. People find God in their everyday, lived, raw experiences. And that's what we want to uh, explore with people. So how do we do that? Well, certain questions that I have found people have asked me, and they open me right up into the present moment. Just things like, hey, what are a few things that you're grateful for right now? Or, hey, tell me what was the highlight of your week this past week? Or, if you know someone better, like what are some of the biggest fears you have in your life as you are moving forward? Or if someone's going through a crisis or something difficult, to ask them, yeah, so I wonder how this suffering is going to change you. Or I wonder what God might be up to in the midst of all this pain. Or even better, questions like, I would really love to know how to pray for you right now. Do you know how I can be praying for you? Or, or to explore with people, what is it like? for you um, right now when you pray. I wonder if you sense God's presence or if, this, if it's a hard time to do all this. Uh, and again, these questions and others, just parenthetically, just to let you know, all that is going to be available for you uh, on my website. Some of this, as you know, is going to be in the handout you're going to get, but the rest of it is all available uh, on my website. So start exploring by asking some uh, general questions. 
Those are some general ones for anyone. There's another way you can approach this, which if you're gonna be spending time with people, I find this super helpful. Of course, as a therapist, I do this and I do it professionally. But if you're gonna be with family or you're gonna be with uh, people that you've spent time with before, consider before you meet with them. I always take time to pray. If I'm gonna go into a family meeting, I pray for a few minutes. Um, with other family members, I pray for a lot longer. <laughs> Uh, just kidding. So, but you want to spend time praying and thinking about what do I know about this person? What are they going through? And then jot in a few questions beforehand so that when you see them, you'll remember to ask them. My parents were great uh, mentors for me in this way. Uh, my parents come from big families and so I had like a gajillion aunts and uncles and literally over a hundred extended family members. So Christmas was really crazy, especially because a lot of these people we would only see at Christmas time when I was a kid. But my parents were tricky. They had a ledger book, and what they would do is every time they were with family members, they'd pull out their ledger book, and they would write down who they talked with and what they learned about them. So for us, on the way home from a family event, it would be time to go through what all of us learned about all of the aunts and uncles and cousins, and they would keep track of all the information we got. Then, as we drove out to the Christmas party the next year, my mom would open the ledger book and read out loud everything we learned the year before, which allowed us, when we saw them, to ask really good questions. You know, if someone was going to have surgery or someone was training for a marathon, to be able to ask them, hey, how'd that surgery go? How'd the marathon go? That is an incredible way to help people feel cared about and listened to. It's a great technique. That's all part of when Pope Francis is inviting us to listen well. That's part of the exploring the raw experiences of people's lives. Now, after we've explored their lives with them, we want to be able to mirror back. And what I mean by mirror is, when we are with people, people are really helped if we can say to them what we hear them say. Now, we've all learned how to do this, right? Someone says, boy, you know, I'm just really sad, and they go on and on, and, and we say to them, oh, wow, it sounds like this is a really hard time for you. That's a big part of mirroring, being able to simply mirror back. And so mirroring back often sounds like we're saying things like, oh, so it sounds like, dot, 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 or, oh, what I hear you saying is, dot, 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 or, wait, let me see if I understand what you're saying. Are you telling me that, dot, 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 and tell them what that, even though it seems a little awkward, sometimes it is profound how healing and helpful that can be. My mentor, uh, one of my mentors, uh, Harville Hendricks, who wrote the book, uh, Getting the Love You Want, and then more recently, a much better book called Making Marriage Simple, which I recommend to anyone who's married. Um, he was just developing his approach to marriage therapy, which was completely different from anything anyone had done in the early 80s. He is seen as the prophet that truly revived and created a marriage therapy that actually helps people. But while he was working on his ideas, and they were very raw, he decided to do an experiment. So his wife is Helen Hunt, she, so she's a big philanthropist, and so she was throwing a big fundraiser, and Harville, of course, was there as her husband. And he made a commitment to himself that all he was going to do the whole night at his table of nine super wealthy people, all he was going to do is mirror back. He wasn't going to say one thing about himself. And so if someone said, hey, what do you do, Harville? Tell us about your life. He would say, you know, I will in a minute, but tell me more about your family. Like, I want to hear more. And then when people would talk about it, he would say, wow, it sounds like, and he, dot, dot, dot. That's all he did the whole night. He said at the end of that night, he felt sort of awkward and he was afraid that people at his table were going to think something was wrong with him. Instead, when Helen came back to him at the end of the night, she said, Harville, what were you talking about all night? And he said, why? And she said, because everyone at your table said you are the most interesting person they have ever met. Which is a riot, right? Because what makes people feel like they're with an interesting person is when they get to talk about themselves and when the other person is truly listening. And so this is really, I think, the powerful third part of listening. We start by noticing each other's faces and seeing what's there. Then we cross over and do all we can to leave our stuff behind so that we can enter into the life of the other, walking on sacred ground, as Pope Francis says. And then thirdly, we explore that world and we mirror back uh, what we're hearing from them. One last piece to this whole process is as we're mirroring back, it's not just what people are saying, it's also what we're noticing. And so when people are saying things like, boy, you know, I got three great kids and they, they talk like that, like I always do about my great kids, uh, one of whom is helping me record this, um, it's helpful to say to someone, 
wow, you look really excited. So pay attention to their face as you cross over and then mirror back all of it. Those, I think, are the three keys that will make us great listeners, which will help us bring the presence of God, the loving, compassionate, merciful presence of God to people, uh, and will cultivate a community that is really bent on listening. So let me summarize where we went in today's webinar. This is the first of four webinars that have to do with how we can get the most out of Amoris Laetitia, how we can use the information in there to really energize our pastoral ministry. So today, I've been talking about listening. In the subsequent webinars, you'll hear more about accompanying, discerning, evangelizing, but today the topic was listening. And one of the questions I asked is, why is it and how is it that Pope Francis has been so uh, persistent in encouraging us to engage people at the level of life experience. And I think the reason for that is because, as we showed in these, in these various seasons of a Christian community, what happens is, while all of us start with an experience of God's presence, over time we end up focused on rules and laws. And the problem is, this isn't where people change. Whether you're talking about psychotherapy, pastoral ministry, or life itself, very few people change because of a way of they were taught new laws or new principles. People change because they are engaged at the, in the raw experiences of their life. And that is what Pope Francis has been saying to us all along, and he says so in a really powerful and meaningful way in Amoris Laetitia. So, the point today was becoming great listeners, engaging down here in people's experiences and the stories of their life and learning how to listen well. And I suggested Taking my cue from Pope Francis and from my own work as a therapist, there's three areas that are really powerful. The first is to start paying attention to each other's faces. And this is true in moment-to-moment -moment interactions. It's also true when we're ministering with people. Start noticing what's happening on their faces. Notice the sacred otherness that comes to us when we just take time to, spend, to look at, into each other's eyes. The second thing uh, that I think we need to do is learn how to pass over as Father John Dunn from Notre Dame says, or um, cross the bridge, if that is a better metaphor for you. How we get from where we are into the world of other people. Other people are so unique. I always say to people who are married, your spouse is way more complicated than you make them out to be. It is time for you to cross the bridge, leave all your junk behind, and start exploring the real person your spouse is, not this image of someone that you're ready to leave. So the first thing is we rediscover faces and then we pass over so we can experience the unique sacredness of each other. And then the third thing is we get good at exploring, getting curious, and then mirroring what people are saying to us. Uh, these are very basic things, but they're sometimes um, very difficult to do, very powerful when we actually uh, get to do them. If we do these three things, I believe that our ministry will start to transform Having taken our cue from Pope Francis, we will start becoming that transformative space for people. The church will come back to life uh, more and more. And I was thinking about this. Not only if we do that, but what would it be like if we were able to inspire and cultivate in our leadership groups and in our parishes a whole culture of listening, a whole culture of people who are suddenly paying more attention to each other's faces and being willing to hear people who think of things differently than them and being willing to explore and mirror, what would that be like? And so I would just say this, for any of these webinars, it's all free. And so feel free, if you think this would be helpful, to send it to people, invite people to pay attention to it, engage you in conversation, engage the parish in conversation about what this would be like. Um, I think that could be really transformative, not just for you, but for your ministry, for your parish, for your school. Um, you know, a question is, what does this look like when you just play it out in real life? And um, my oldest daughter just uh, got back. She was living uh, in Tanzania for a while and working in an orphanage. And she told us the story when she got back. And I think it kind of captures the essence of what um, we are talking about here. Uh, a few days after she arrived at this orphanage, she noticed a little boy playing over on his own in the sandbox at this place. And uh, he was kind of rocking back and forth, and he wasn't speaking, and she had asked the, the, the leaders there what was going on with him, and they said they didn't know he had been dropped off, so he was now the orphanage's charge to take care of. And they said, you know, he was eating and sleeping, but he wouldn't interact with anybody. They thought maybe he had autism, 
or some kind of major cognitive or developmental delay. And so my daughter, uh, Shannon, decided just to kind of cross over and get curious. And so she began, whenever she was done with her other responsibilities, just walking over to him and sitting with him in the sandbox. And she would actually kind of rub his back and say, Pole sana zawati, pole sana. And what that meant is, um, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And she would just rub his back and kind of peek around at his face. And as she noticed the sadness, she would just say, oh, pole sana, pole sana. Well, she did this day after day, and eventually there was no change. Then after a while, after a week, um, Zawati began looking up at her, giving her a little smile now and then, but then he wouldn't talk with her. She began coming back long after her shift when it was time for them to go to bed, and she would sit on his bedside table and just rub his back and whisper to him, pole sana, Zawati, because she knew he had been through quite a bit. Well, over a period of time, he began making eye contact, and the two of them began to interact, and eventually he became a part of the community there. Uh, as it turned out, he had been uh, dropped off by his family. He did have some pretty significant issues, and his family had left him at the orphanage because they couldn't afford to care for him. Uh, but over time, he became a full member of that uh, community there at the orphanage and very close uh, with my daughter. And you ask, how did that happen? It happened because... Um, Really because my daughter was given by God, I think, a real love for this young boy and was able to pass over, notice his face, explore, mirror, until eventually he came to life. And while we may not face those intense or severe experiences or people in our communities, I think it's a great metaphor of what happens to human beings when someone really takes the time to listen really well. And so what I'd like to do is just close this webinar just by praying for you and praying for us, those of us who, who get a chance to serve in the kingdom for a living. And um, so let's just do that. I would just invite you to um, join me to pray for the people close to you, for your ministry, for people who are watching this webinar. And we do pray, God, that your spirit would activate us, that your kingdom would come into our midst, starting with our spouses, our family, and then also with our other leaders we work with, and then with the people you bring across our paths, that you would give us this grace to see them for the sacred creations they are, that you'd awaken in us a real um, respect and love for them as other and different, to see them through the lens that you have for them as unique, sacred beings, and then that you'd allow us to be really good at exploring and mirroring with them so that they might come to life. And, and even more than that, that they might look at us at the gaze we have for them and see your gaze of love. That they would see Christ in us looking at Christ in them and that it would be powerful and transformative all through this act of listening. So we welcome your spirit to do that in us and pray that you do it. And we do pray all this through Christ the Lord. Uh, amen. So... One more time, just want to thank you for joining uh, this webinar. Um, if you would like more information about anything you heard today or about the webinars, um, certainly you have some uh, contacts already, but you can come to my website, uh, which is drtimhogan.com. You can also join us for a panel discussion. If you're watching this in real time, there will be a panel discussion following this. You can check the schedule that you have. Um, if you're watching this long after, the panel discussion will also be available so you can click on it and watch the panel discussion as it happened. So thank you. It's been a pleasure being able to do this webinar with you. God bless you. Mm -hmm.